Okay, so we just finished talking about the price ceiling. Now we're going to talk about the price floor. Price floor is the opposite of a price ceiling, obviously. This is where the price can't go any lower for a product. The government comes in, sets that price floor, and as you see here, typically they set that price floor above equilibrium price. That's going to create a surplus for you. Okay, because again, you're looking at now if the price is set above equilibrium, the price is too high. Okay, the price is too high, which is going to create that surplus. That's that extra product still sitting on the shelf. Nobody's buying it because the price can't go lower. Okay, um, best example of this, as you see here, is minimum wage. Would a business pay you less than $7.25 an hour if they could? Yes, they would. How do I know? Because they used to pay me less than they do now. Um, when I worked at Fountain Carl Washington High School, they paid me $4.25 an hour. They pay guys to do the same job today, $7.25 an hour, only because the government here tells them to. Other than that, they would, they would pay less than that if they could. That creates a surplus of workers. You have more people willing to do those minimum wage jobs because they're getting paid more for it than what they really should. So that's, where, that's how we get a surplus in that situation. So let's see what it looks like on the chart. On the chart, the market for orange juice here. Now we have the price floor in place up here. And again, as you see it, price is trying to get lower. Price is trying to go lower here trying to get to this magic mark of equilibrium right here, but can't get there because the price floor is stopping it. The price floor right here is keeping that price from coming any lower like it wants to do, which as we said before, winds up with more supply. Your quantity supplied here is seven, your quantity demanded here is three. So then you got all this surplus, all this extra in your triangle here, simply because the government put a price floor in place and won't let that, that price drop. Should it drop? Yes, but they won't let it. Um, th that is why minimum wage does not work. Price is too high, government won't change it. Okay, now, now let's get into the complicated stuff, okay? Changes in quantity demanded and demand. Now, key thing here, okay? This is where the, the thinking through, making sure you have that base knowledge of things really comes into place because there is a difference between quantity demanded and demand. They are two different things. They when there is a change in quantity demanded, the result on the graph is different from a change in demand as a whole. Um, ch change in demand as a whole looks different graphically than a change in quantity demanded. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so distinguish between supply and quantity supplied between demand and quantity demand, it tells you right there in the standard, there's two different things. Um, and we're also gonna look at the determinants or the shifters of demand. These are the things down here in, in substandard F that make the demand curve, make for a change in demand, make the demand curve as a whole move. So what does that mean? First off, a change in quantity demanded. A change in quantity demanded, first off, is a move along the demand curve okay and the only thing that's changing there is a change in price we've talked about this already you have the same demand schedule all you are doing is moving from one price point to another price point okay when you move from b to d you move from a to c you move from b to c c to b c to a when those prices change, if you raise your prices, if you put something on sale, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Price is the only thing that changes here with, um, with the product. And when that happens, you have a change in quantity 
demanded. Okay, when you move from here to here and move from here to here, that's a change in quantity demanded. It, um, changing out one price point for another, that is a change in quantity demanded. So most times, that's what you're, you know, that's what you're looking at. Okay. Now, how does that differ from other options for us? Okay. A change in demand is when the quantity demanded at every price is different. There's your keyword, every price. Okay you are creating an entirely new demand schedule. You are creating an entirely new demand curve here because it doesn't, you didn't go from $15 to $12 or from 12 to nine. At 15, there's a different quantity. At 12, there's a different quantity. At nine, there's a different quantity. So because every price is changing, demand as a whole, changes okay whole new demand schedule whole new curve not a new point a new curve new schedule scratch this out this is no longer because this is your new curve here okay that's the most critical thing to understand the difference between change in quantity demanded and change in demand. So let's back up. Change in quantity demanded, same curve, different points. Change in demand, every point gets a new quantity demanded, whole new curve, okay? Now, two quick things to remember. An increase in, now once you realize that change in demand creates a whole new demand curve, now you need to know which way the demand curve moves. Does it move to the right or does it move to the left? And the quick and easy way that we teach to remember this is more is to the right, okay? Every time, whether you're talking about demand or supply more is to the right okay you can even take this back to the production possibilities curve that we talked about um, at the beginning toward the beginning of the semester when that PPC moved out moved to the right that meant more production was happening it's the same thing with supply and demand when that demand curve moves to the right that it, that shows an increase in demand at every price so more is to the right. So look at it here. Now, even if, you, if you, even if you don't remember more to the right, you can look at it visually. At this price here, if we take this price point here, originally on this demand curve, nine were demanded at that price. But with this new curve, that same price is gonna give you a different amount demanded. And same thing for every other price. Let's change our color here so we can see this. Originally, $1.50 would have this many. Now, $1.50, if we stretch it out to here, is more than it was before. Okay, so that increase in demand, moving the entire curve, gives you different quantities demanded at every single price point. Okay, so more is to the right. Now, what is a decrease in demand show us? A decrease in demand moves that to the left. Okay, so again, at this price point, originally, oh, let me go back. Originally, it was here, but now it's here because that curve moved to the left, which moved our amount demanded down. We went from demanding about nine and a half to demanding about six. And again, it's not just a price point. 
it's every price point because if we change our color again, dollar and a half was originally here. Now it is shifted to here. Okay, again, the curve moves to the left, moving that quantity demanded down at every price. Okay, less to the left, less to the left. I can't repeat that enough times to drill that into your head. Decrease in demand is less to the left. Okay. Now, now the question is, what makes these, these demand curves move to the left or to the right? Because when we talked before, if we're moving along the curve, it was moving along the curve from this point to this point, same curve, different price point. That is a change in quantity demanded. What changed there? I'll give you a second to think about it. What changed from this point to this point? If you're moving along the curve here, okay, that is a change in price. You went from one price point to another. That's the only thing that's changing. That's a change in quantity demanded, okay? Moving this whole curve is something completely different. Something other than price has to make, has to change your desire for that product. Because remember, we said from the very beginning, Demand is not only the desire for something, but the ability to pay for it. So what other than the price of something could change your desire to buy it? Those things are called the shifters or the determinants of demand. Okay. These are things that other than the price can change your desire or ability to buy a product. And they are as follows. And we're going to go through these individually, but compliments, substitutes, income, how much money you're making, okay? Compliments and substitutes are things that you could buy to either go along with or instead of the product you're looking at and that you had demand for, the amount of money you're making, your taste or your, you know, the popularity of something, certain expectations you may have in the future, and the overall population of an area and the population of the, the demographic group for that product. Okay. Now, first off, we want to look at compliments. Compliments are things that go together. Okay. Demand for these things because they go together, because you're buying one thing to use with the other. Okay. They complement each other. Okay. Um, and let's put that up here. Compliment means they go together. Now I will say this, and me and Miss Lane were talking about this the other day with Miss Fields. In the simple fact that some things that I may think are a compliment, you may not. Miss Lane gave a great example. Um, her son, I believe she said, likes a peanut butter and ham sandwich. Now that to me sounds absolutely disgusting, but for him, those two things go together. For me, those would not be compliments. Okay. Um, you know, but for, for her son, it's one of his favorite sandwiches. So, um, I, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, but you get the point. Some people think that, um, hamburgers and hot dogs go together. Me I either, I'm going to have, you know, I may have one or the other, Nate Howard may have them both together. So for him, those will be compliments. He's going to get a burger and a hot dog. Okay. Um, but the key thing is compliments go together. Demand, and because they go together, demand for these things work the same. Okay. When one goes up, the other one goes up. Okay. So this is where the complicated thinking begins. So we see our examples down here, peanut butter and jelly are compliments. Milk and cereal are compliments. Bacon and eggs are compliments. So if something happens to one, the relationship with the other is going to be affected in the same way. Okay. So here's your question. When a compliment is on sale, demand for the complimentary good 
does what? Okay, so think about this. The price for peanut butter drops. Okay. Okay, so if the price for peanut butter drops, are people going to buy more peanut butter or less peanut butter? They're going to buy more peanut butter. Okay. Now, because jelly is a complement for peanut butter, if people are buying more peanut butter, therefore people are going to buy, theoretically, more jelly. Okay. So when a complement is on sale, demand for the complementary good is going to go up. Okay. If milk is on sale, people will buy, buy more cereal because they're probably going to buy more milk. No matter what price the cereal is, they're going to buy more cereal because now they have more milk. Same thing with bacon and eggs. Okay. Complements work together. If if you buy more of one, you're going to buy more of the other. Okay. That's a key thing to think about because think of, think of this picture, this together, the, the bacon and the eggs are holding hands here. Okay. So if one goes up, the other one's got to go up. where one goes, the other one goes because they're holding hands. They're complementing each other. They go together. You know, that's, that's the way it works. Okay. Now substitutes on the other hand, our next one is substitutes. Substitutes work different. Okay. Substitutes don't work, go together. Substitutes replace each other. Substitutes replace. Just like if we'll give a we'll give an example, of something other than sports here. If a band, a rock band, fires their lead singer because he's a diva and he has too many demands and he's just too hard to deal with. They replace him. They find a substitute for him to come in and sing in his place. Okay. So the demand for one is different from the demand for the other. So therefore with substitutes demands for these things work the opposite of each other. One goes up, the other one goes down because they're replacing each other. We don't want this one anymore, but we do want the other one. Okay. So when a substitute on, is on sale, demand for the substitute good is going to go up. So look at this. Look at this here. Oh, and I'm going to need to stop for just one second. I jumped ahead of myself there. See, I'm human too, guys. Demand is going to go down. Okay. Because when a substitute is on sale, demand for the substitute good. And this is kind of a weird wording. I probably need to say this different. Um, Look at your example down here with Coke and Pepsi. What happens with the Coke? Price here for the Coke is going up. So if Coke is more expensive, okay, that means people are going to buy it. The quantity demanded of Coke is going to go down because people are buying less Coke because now it's more expensive. Well, if you don't buy Coke, what are you going to buy instead? Pepsi or Sam's Cola or Laurel Lee and Cola, or what, you know, any other option other than Coca-Cola. This, this a substitute for Coca-Cola. So as this happens, as the price goes up, that means people are buying less Coca-Cola, which means the demand for Pepsi at every price is going to shift to the right and have more demand for Pepsi because it is a substitute. Okay. Because it is a substitute. So, um, if businesses continue to, you know, take time off or shut down because of the coronavirus, you're going to have to find somewhere else to get your food. Okay, um, as Kroger ran out 
of paper towels and toilet paper and Lysol and hand cleaners. Other people had to, the people had to find substitutes for shopping at Kroger. So the demand for things from Kroger went down and the demand for things at other stores, Ingles, Publix, Walmart, whoever, it's going to go up because the demand for the other ones went down because they're having to find a substitute. They're having to replace that option. So that's the key thing to think about. Think about replacing. If you're replacing one with another, whatever one does, the, op the other one does the opposite. Okay, that's your, that's your substitute rule there. Now, next, what about your income? Okay. When your income increases, you get a raise or you get a new job or you get a job. Income, an income increase is going to lead to a rise or a, hey, let me go back here. Sorry about that. Okay. Going to lead to a rise or an increase in demand for normal goods. But, um, so if you make more money, you're gonna demand more normal goods. Or another way to say normal here is think name brand, okay? Think name brand. Sorry, I'm writing with my mouse which is not so easy to do. Not as easy as just standing up at the board and writing, okay, name brand. So an income increase leads to a rise in demand for name brand goods. At the same time, an income increase is going to lead to a fall or a decrease in demand for inferior goods. What are inferior goods? These are your inferior goods. your knockoffs, your no names, okay? Um, instead of, if, if, you, um, if you get a raise, you're gonna stop, you're gonna stop buying these no name stuff. Stop buying the off brand stuff. But Coach Simmons, I love Dr. Thunder. Stop, okay? Coach Simmons, I love ramen noodles. Don't wanna hear it. When you, when you get an income increase, it's going to lead to a fall, a decrease in demand for inferior goods. You're gonna buy the name brand stuff, you're gonna buy the regular you know, option of things, not the knockoffs. It's the way it happens. Now, what if you lose your job? What if you have to take a pay cut? What if you're an hourly worker and coronavirus comes through and all of a sudden you can't go into work? Like all these people at arenas and stadiums that where all these concerts and sporting events are being canceled. Those people are gonna see a decrease in their income. So are they gonna keep buying Frosted Flakes and regular Dr. Pepper? No, in this time, they're probably gonna put a crunch on things and their demand for normal goods is gonna go down for them, okay? So you have to think about it in this way. It, more money in your pocket, more, de more demand for good stuff, right? I really don't feel like I need to explain this too much. I feel like I'm going to, but you don't have to just think about what you would do. If you had more money, what would you buy? If you had less money, what kind of stuff would you buy? How would your, um, how would your buying habits change if you had more money or less money in your pocket with your income? Okay. Now, what about a change in taste? What happens when a good becomes more popular? Okay, when a good becomes more popular, demand goes up, okay, which is gonna shift to the right. Okay, again, demand goes up, demand increases, more demand shifted to the right. Um, vans are pretty popular these days. As vans become, I mean, again, vans were popular back in the 80s when I was a kid, okay? They're, they're nothing new. They're nothing that hip. They were, you know, and like my language there, but they were popular in the 80s. They kind of went away for a while. Now they're back to being popular again. 
they'll probably go away soon if they haven't already and I'm using a bad example. But um, when things are popular, demand goes up. When things are not popular, demand goes down. Okay, silly bands. There was a time when silly bands were very popular and demand for silly bands was through the roof. Everybody wanted to buy them. Um, everybody wanted to, you know, have them out for, for you to buy because they knew they were popular. But once these things wore off and the demand was not there or the popularity was not there, the demand went away as well. Okay. So vans, something like this is real popular. This popular today would move the demand curve to the right because it's popular. This, because it's a decrease, silly bands, the demand curve has moved to the left. Okay. Now, expectations. As a consumer, a paying customer with demand, if your expectation of price in the future is that the price in the near future is going to decrease your demand for that product right now, okay? Two key things here. We're talking about future, and I just clicked again. First thing here, future price, okay? If you think the price in the future is going to be lower, what are you currently going to do? Your current demand will go down because you're going to wait. Okay, that means you're going to wait to buy. No one, most people, unless they absolutely have to have it, no one buys TVs or computers or anything like that in the few weeks leading up to Thanksgiving. Why? because they know Black Friday is coming, because Black Friday is coming down on the calendar in a couple of days, in a couple of weeks. People say, hmm, I could buy a TV now, or I could wait and try and get a good Black Friday deal, because they know that price is going to decrease here in the, in the near future. Their demand at that time is down, because they're going to wait it out and wait for that price to drop before they try to buy it. Now, what about the flip of that? What if you know prices are about to go up? If your expectation, think about yearbooks, okay? Most people buy their yearbooks at the, pay for their yearbooks at the beginning of the school year because they know as time goes on, prices will go up and they want to get it at that cheaper price now so they go ahead and buy it. Think of prom tickets that you've been buying. When they first went on sale, they were as cheap as they were. That's when most prom tickets are sold or at the very beginning because they're the cheapest. You expect that price to go up in the future. So you don't want to wait. You want to buy it then. Okay. This is the kind of complex thinking that I, that I warned you about. You have to stop. And I feel like I'm going through this kind of fast. But if you can slow it down and think your way through it. Okay. Hmm, I could buy that product now, or in two weeks, I could get it cheaper. Am I going to buy it now, or am I going to buy it in two weeks? I'm going to buy it in two weeks. So my demand now has decreased because of that cheaper future expectation of price. Okay, now, what about population? Population should be pretty straightforward for you. Population is increasing. Now, if the population increases, what does that mean? That means more people, right? And if there are more people moving into an area, what does that mean for demand in that area? Demand for goods will go up. More people means more demand, okay? And it can be specific to certain goods. What if you have a, a specific increase in the population of older people? Then you're going to see things like prescription drugs, things like maybe eyeglasses or depend to undergarments or walkers or canes or orthotic shoes increase because 
of the increase in that specific population, okay? We've seen more and more people move into Monroe County over the last few years. We've seen more and more restaurants, more and more stores open up, and that's evidence of that. More population, more people, more demand for products. More po in increase in population, increase in demand, which again would shift that demand curve which way? To the right. Okay, so now let's look at um, let's look at some examples here. Let's see how you're how you're getting this information. Okay, so which of the following is a change in quantity demanded? You got turkey sells more when ham prices increase. Turkey is buy one, get one free. Turkey sells less when bread is more expensive. And turkey is on sale for $1.99 a pound. Which of these four is a change in quantity demanded? Okay, now, if you want to pause it for a second and think about it, you can. Otherwise, I'm going on. Now, if you want to pause in three, two, one. Okay, now, quantity demanded. Qu couple key, couple things here. Go back. Okay. First off, the, the, the thing to think about, quantity demanded, quantity demanded, two words means a change in price of the product that we're talking about, okay? Turkey is buy one, get one free. That means that the turkey is basically half price. That would be quantity demanded. Turkey is on sale for $1.99 a pound. That would be quantity demanded because the price of turkey went down. Now, why do the other two not count, okay? Turkey sells more when ham prices increase. In this situation, turkey sells more when ham prices increase. So if ham prices, let's think through this, ham prices increase. So if ham goes up in price, that means are people gonna buy more ham or less ham when it's more expensive? You're right, they're gonna buy less ham. So if they're buying less ham, they need a good substitute. So this would be a substitute situation. And because they are substitutes, that means the opposite. So they're buying less ham because of the price increase, so they're, therefore they're going to buy more turkey, substitute, okay? And if they're buying more turkey, that would shift the curve to the right. Now, turkey sells less when bread is more expensive. Bread and turkey are what? Complements. Because you're buying the turkey and the bread to go together for sandwiches. So if bread is more expensive, that means people are gonna buy less bread, which means there's gonna buy less turkey which means that supply curve for turkey would move to the, or demand curve, excuse me, for turkey would move to the left, okay? Just a couple of things. Again, price of the turkey, price of the turkey, quantity demanded. Price of something else, move the whole curve, left or right. And that's when your substitutes and complements come into play here, okay? Okay, now, now we're gonna look at changes in quantity supplied and supply, a change in supply. These are gonna work at the, at the core of it very much like changes in quantity demanded and changes in demand. We're just dealing with a supply curve and thinking about it from the business owner's perspective instead of from the consumer's perspective now, okay? So 
as we go through here, now we're looking at how much product is being put on the shelf. Remember, supply, quantity supplied, you need to think product on the shelf. Okay, so what kind of things change how much of a product is on the shelf and how does it change how much of a product is on the shelf? Okay, so the um, microeconomic standard two, substandard B, distinguished between supply and quantity supplied and substandard E, you need to be able to know the, the with the supply curve. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. Um, had a small glitch in my recording for a second. I think we're gonna get this going back again here. Just a second. My Wi-Fi is not being fun. Okay. So as we were saying just a second ago, 